Hello. Our story begins shortly after the Battle of Christophsis. Obon had requested a student of his own, but the Grand Master decided that Ahsoka would be more fit for Anakin, which was likely true. Despite their little skirmishes and their first few interactions, they were made for each other, and truthfully, Obon was more than happy with the decision that Yoda made. Though instead of being paired up with someone that could haul sass like Obon himself, he was assigned a young student who had a bit more closeness with the Order itself. The young Jedi he was being assigned to was Cal Kestis. As a youngling, he strived for excellence, which initially would make sense why Yoda thought he'd be best suited for Kenobi. However, the thing that alluded to Cal was his ability to handle failure. As of his early days of training, he excelled, but because of his excelled training, he was left very easily upset by the slightest failure. Obi-Wan understood what failure was like. He took on this responsibility with great stride. As the newest member of the Jedi High Council, this would be an excellent way for Obi-Wan to distribute his knowledge. He was, after all, very keen on the idea of being a Jedi Master again, so why not do it with someone like Cal? Obi-Wan, once given his new student, wouldn't really have time for pleasantries. Similarly to how Anakin received Ahsoka, Obi-Wan got his new student when he was on the battlefront. For Cal, this was an eye-opening event, and not for nothing, kind of dramatic. Why were the Jedi sending their children to the front lines? Anyways, Cal would be in for a lot of hard work. He was with Obi-Wan Kenobi, who was already showing off his skills as a militaristic general. He may have been a Jedi, but his like the ring of the name General Kenobi suited him unlike any other accompanying rank. When Cal was introduced, he wasn't tossed to the wolves. Instead, he kept close with Obi-Wan. He'd done an exercise similar to this with Skywalker, though with Anakin they weren't fighting a war or on a battlefront. This was a little different, and by a little, it was a lot different. Cal stuck close to his new master's side and didn't leave it. The battlefront was a scary place, and while there wasn't an active battle going on at the moment, Cal was quickly introduced to what war would be like for him from here on out. The war would cost him everything, and it would require his utmost attention, focus, and determination. To see the horrors of what the battle brought was already enough to entrench his mind in terror. Wounded men lined the trenches, and downed tanks sat as refuge for cover as the men prepared for the next leg of this war. Obi-Wan was as calm as anyone would think. For Cal, it was a little bit tantalizing, because he felt the pressure of training under a Jedi Council member. Not just a Council member, but the man who taught the literal Chosen One. As a kid, these kind of stupid things can get under your skin really quickly, which for Cal, it did. not He had this insatiable pressure to live up to the standards that Obi-Wan didn't have for him. In his mind, he thought that Obi-Wan would want him to be the greatest student he'd ever seen and be perfect without ever faltering or messing up, which again, was incredibly false. The new master and apprentice walked along the trenches. This was the first lesson. Their men were their concern. Obi-Wan made it very obvious for Cal that to be a general, or in his case a commander, the men were his priority. There was nothing noble in acting superior towards them. They were their fellow man. Obi-Wan continued on, though Cal thought there was more to be said about this by his new master. It wasn't said because Obi-Wan knelt down to make sure one of the wounded troopers was alright. He asked that the clone needed to be evacuated from the battlefront and sent back on the first transport back to the fleet. The trooper shook his head and thanked the general for his care. As they continued, Cody came up to them and was introduced to the new commander. And while Jedi typically had command over the commanders or captains of given squads or battalions, Obi-Wan wasn't going to just hand the rank and the responsibility to his student, and he made that very clear, informing Cody that while Cal might be referred to as commander, the highest ranking individual would be Cody, that is obviously aside from himself. Kenobi didn't know Cal and Cal didn't know Obi-Wan, aside from reputation, so Obi-Wan thought for the time being that it would be effective to teach by example. He couldn't baby Cal around on the battlefield, he needed to be ready, so having Cal follow him along with him worked really well. Obi-Wan in reality was a terrific teacher, and teaching and leading by example would be the best way for Cal to see where this bond was going. Obi-Wan once finished, turned back, and apologized to Cal, and explained that he wouldn't ignore him intentionally, and that this wouldn't exactly be the most common way to approach their newfound bond, but on the battlefront, his mind was turned into defense mode. He had to always be ready, and he had to keep the troops in line. Obi-Wan quickly established their boundaries, the respect that Cal was expected to display to the clones, and the dynamic the relationship would likely have. Kenobi asked where he left off, and Cal quickly noted the word nobility, and Obi-Wan nodded and he carried forward with a tug of his robes, and said there's nothing noble in being superior to your fellow man. True nobility comes from being superior to your former self. Cal's jaw hit the ground. 
but swiftly picked it up as Oberon placed his hand on his student's shoulder and guided him forward. Within a couple of hours, a battle would break out. The clones would be engulfed by the war and the droid forces. Oberon valiantly led his men in, and Cal followed suit, though there was a bit of timidness coming from the young Jedi, which was fine. With Kenobi leading the charge, there was no worry for Commander Kestis falling behind. The men noticed that he was rattled and showed him respect by sticking with him. It was yet another lesson for the young Jedi. When the Republic claimed victory over the planet, Obi-Wan didn't immediately scold his student. He simply asked why he was afraid. Obi-Wan could feel it, so there's no reason to hide it. Cal was afraid of going into combat. The war was much larger in person than it ever was inside of the articles posted on Coruscant and laying around the temple. On Coruscant, the war felt so small and far away, and when the first clone trooper dropped in front of him, everything became real. Cal expressed his fear for letting the men down, and before Obi-Wan could say anything, Cody came around the corner and asked Kenobi if he could share some insight, and Obi-Wan nodded his head. While it had only been a couple months since they first met each other, Obi-Wan and Commander Cody were as close to brothers as any of the clones were with each other. Their bond was special, and they spoke the same language, sometimes without even having to say a word. When Cody came over to Cal, he told him that he wouldn't let the men down. The true tragedy of war is that men would die. But that was what the clones were bred for. Cody expressed that as long as Cal thought about his men and fought for them, then more of them would stay alive. What Obi-Wan was doing was creating a barrier for the clones to survive behind. Cal would be an addition to that. Cody then continued and said that as a commander, he had a duty to his men more than he did anyone else. He had to be willing to lay down his life on the line, or they wouldn't respect him. The clones understood the shyness of the first encounter with the battle. All the clones felt it the first time engaging with droid forces, the butterflies and then the sheer terror. Nothing on Kamino could prepare them for all the cries and agony. It was just something that they had to adapt to, and Cal would get it eventually. The main point that Cody got across is that Cal was a leader. As long as he led, then people would rally behind him. It would take time before he could actually ever lead a group of clones, but when that day came, he was confident that everything would work out well for the Jedi, and that he would rise to the moment and the occasion. When Cody was finished, Master and Apprentice continued their talk. Obi-Wan reiterated a couple talking points, but in a more direct and concise manner. They were Jedi. The clones were living beings, and they were to be valued as such. Obi-Wan and Cal understood this. To fight on the front lines and to actively put his life on the line was a horror of war, but Cal had to remember. While it was stressful and tense, he had his master. Obi-Wan would always be in front of him, because as much of Cal's responsibility as it was to make sure the clones survived, it was even more so Obi-Wan's responsibility to make sure that Cal survived too. They would clean up and eventually return to the fleet. Inside of the Venator, Obi-Wan would continue his instruction. Having taught Anakin, this was a breeze. Cal was far from rebellious. He had his moments, every youngling in Padawan did, but nothing like Anakin. Obi-Wan could surely teach anyone after having go through what Skywalker put him through. Being that he was already ready for anything, Cal would really quite be the student for Obi-Wan the train. While some of his special abilities in the Force hadn't been realized yet, Cal had a lot of practice when it came to saber technique. As a youngling, Cal was prepared with everything in the base lightsaber form which was Form 1. Having all that knowledge was great. Now he could choose where he wanted to go. More aggressive, speedier, balanced, or defensive. The choices were his to make, but his master Obi-Wan had to make sure his student had everything he needed to make sure that he had an educated choice on the form that would best suit him in the future. Luckily for Obi-Wan, training Cal was much easier than he could have ever expected it to be. In reality, Cal wasn't a pushover, he just wasn't Anakin. Which isn't a knock, necessarily, on Anakin. It's just more so that Obi-Wan went through a grueling training process with his first student. Obi-Wan would lay out the basic forms for Cal, and this wild young Jedi would lean into one of the most difficult forms for a young Force user to learn. Cal had an interest in Form 6, mostly for his balanced state. Its structure was based off of and heavily influenced by Form 3 and Form 4, which were very polar opposite forms. 3 was heavy defense and 4 was strong offense. However, the lucky part of having Obi-Wan as his teacher is that he was the master of defense. Also, Kenobi's teacher was a master of Form 4 too. Kenobi would be a great assistance for Cal in trying to learn this difficult form. Anyways, aside from all of that, Cal had his first real test of the war coming up. The campaign of Ryloth was heating up, and Kenobi and Cal were the second wave of the assault. They had to be prepared for what they couldn't prepare for. Unlike any other previous experience, this was the first time civilians were being used as human shields, so the clones and the Jedi had to be extra careful. As much as this mission was based in relief efforts, they had to make sure everyone survived. Civilian casualties could not be allowed. Everything actually went very well for the two Jedi. Obi-Wan and Cal went deep until Obi-Wan sent Cal with Waxer and Boyle for the remainder of the mission. 
While they would lose communication, Obi-Wan's trust for his student would allow the entire situation to play out beautifully. They would find Numa and save her. Cal and Obi-Wan would continue their fight and liberate the Twi'leks and take down the heavy cannons, allowing Windu to continue the next leg of the operations on the planet. Because of Cal's effectiveness in the battle, he'd be allowed to become a commander of a small operation in the next mission, which would go rather well. He of course finally felt the pressure of being a leader, but because of his listening skills, he wouldn't get too deep, he wouldn't go too far, he would listen. Cal was more or less focused on his men's survival, which initially sounds positive. His issue was his lack of focus on anything else, which meant that the structure of their strategy would fall through. But Obi-Wan didn't necessarily hold it against his student. See, Cal was let into the act of war much earlier than he should have been allowed to. He was almost the same age as the clones. He wasn't much older than 11, and the average Padawan was typically 13 or 14, but 13, like Ahsoka, was typically really young. He just happened to show promise and he was, well, effective. Still learning a lot, but he had gone far in the past couple months, proving Yoda's belief in Cal. The next most difficult task for Cal would be the second battle of Genosis. The clones went head into the desert world, and it was far more confrontational of a battle than the previous time the Jedi were here. With three important legs in the assault on the planet, Obi-Wan's unit was the only one to land at its landing point, though with heavy flak, Obi-Wan's vessel was shot down, the only survivors being another clone, Obi-Wan and Cal, though Cal, because of his age, was very badly injured. A part of his vertebrae was broken out of place, which prohibited him from walking. When Waxer and Boyle came to the rescue, Obi-Wan had to carry his student from the wreckage. It was heroic to say the least, but Obi-Wan began to see flaws with Yoda's line of thinking, especially with allowing Cal into the battlefield at such an age. Age. Though, as much as Obi-Wan could blame Yoda, he was the one that approved Cal coming to Genosis to begin with. Obi-Wan just hoped that Ahsoka and Anakin were faring better than they were. They would come to find out that they were actually doing pretty well not long after. While Obi-Wan and Anakin were close, the same couldn't be said for Ahsoka and Cal. They had a stint with each other on Naboo during the Blue Shadow Virus outbreak, but aside from that, they didn't really interact with each other. They also wouldn't have a chance to build a bond here on Genosis, because Obi-Wan and ki mundi were leaving the battlefront and allowing Luminara unduly and Anakin to handle the next leg of the campaign. Obi-Wan would return in the final day of the battle, but this time he wouldn't come with Cal. His poor student was sat up inside of a back to tank, healing from his broken back. Obi-Wan knew this would be very problematic. Stunting his student's growth as an individual was entirely a real possibility. But the medics were working as hard as they possibly could to ensure that the young commander got out of everything alright. After Obi-Wan left, and Genosis was secured, they'd move on. This would leave Obi-Wan left to go to Mandalore by himself which had Cal staying on Coruscant. This actually wasn't a big deal for Cal. He was hanging around the clone troopers and keeping as much rest as possible. Cal wasn't even inside the temple most of the time. He stayed on the Venator with a number of the clone troopers, who didn't go to the main barracks on Coruscant. Cal enjoyed bonding with the clones. And while he couldn't walk still, and was struggling even to stand, the 212th men brought Cal with them and taught him how to play Sabacc and bet on fathier races. Maybe it wasn't the most ethical thing to teach a young Jedi, but it did take his mind off the pain that he was in. So was it really that bad? The Mandalore endeavor for Kenobi would ignite an old flame for him, but it wouldn't deter him from firstly helping Satine and then returning to teach Cal. The young student didn't mind that Obi-Wan was constantly on the mission during this time. He had the clones with him, and that was fine with him. Cal understood that even in his young age, that Obi-Wan as a Jedi Master had a lot of responsibilities, and not all of them had to pertain to him. Though luckily for Cal, because of his injury, he was able to avoid running into General Grievous when the Jedi were going to save Eeth Koth. Not for nothing, Cal was really having a hard time with his recovery. He yearned to join the men on the front lines. Because he was still recovering, he was spending a lot of time with the clones in the barracks, playing Sabacc and betting on the Fathers. Every new mission would have less clones showing up to the barracks. Most of the time it was due to death, though every so often it would be an injury which was much better than a clone dying. This did eat away at Cal, and he really wanted to be back on the battlefront with the clones, but he physically couldn't. The struggles of this lesson had Obi-Wan by his student's side, aiding him through the entire endeavor as best as he could. Kenobi knew that this was something very arduous for Cal to go through, and he wanted to be sure that his young student didn't go through it alone. Through Republic medical work, Cal was able to make a recovery rather quickly. However, he'd be restricted from active combat, the reason being is he's placed in a back brace for the next several months, which would have Cal sitting out during key battles, missions, and campaigns, such as the Battle of Kamino, the Hunt for Zero, a trip to Mortis, the rescue at the Citadel, and the Battle of Umbara. Though truthfully, Obi-Wan was very relieved that his student didn't go to 
to Umbara. He didn't express this openly, it was more or less a secret he kept to himself. Plus Anakin and Ahsoka weren't even present for the mission to Umbara, so he was the only true Jedi on the planet anyways. Cal was really hard on himself during this time, but this is where Obi-Wan was able to shine for a student. Kenobi was often considered the weakest of his class as a youngling, and even as a young Padawan. Kenobi was a late bloomer, so he didn't really fill into his midichlorians until he's a young adult. So, while it seemed as if Obi-Wan would never make it as a Jedi, which he took really heavily, he did finally grow into it. The Order meant everything to him, and Obi-Wan was incredibly dedicated to the life of being a Jedi, and he didn't want to be a failure to himself or to his future self, though he realized that there was a difference between being hard on yourself and abusing yourself. Everyone has their limits, and you can only go so far at a particular moment. Obi-Wan learned to come to peace with this predicament, and ensured he taught these lessons to Cal so he wouldn't struggle through the same difficulties. With the help of his master, Cal was able to emotionally overcome these trials, which allowed him to become the best version of himself, as well as the best version of a Jedi of himself. He still had a long ways to go, but he was more than prepared when he joined his master, Anakin, and Ahsoka on Chile. Cal at this point was still being regulated to action, but he was at least able to be a part of the landing procedure and join the troops on the ground. After an almost fatal bombing attempt, Kenobi went to aid the negotiations for the Degruta people from the Zygerian scum. At the same time, Cal, Anakin, and Ahsoka would go out across the city to find the bombs to save the people who were no longer on the planet. The operation was successful in stopping the bombing of the capital city. However, there were no people in the capital to be saved, which was a bit of an odd predicament to be in. Cal would join the three Jedi on their mission to Zygeria. It would be on this mission where he'd actually finally have a bonding moment with Ahsoka. They had a very rigid companionship, and now that they were reliant on each other to be at their best, they were able to break through the rigid boundaries of their friendship. While the stress of the mission to Zygeria would be a wake-up call for Cal, having been absent from missions for so long, he was glad to finally be able to return to an active fighting front and help the people of the galaxy. That meant a lot for him at the very least. Ever since he was able to start walking, even with the brace, he was practicing his lightsaber skill, but it was very apparent to not just him but Obi-Wan that he was very clearly lacking in his progression, which obviously wasn't his fault. Obi-Wan never held it against him, though because of Cal's energy and his focus on the Force during that time, he was able to realize he had a lot more potential in the Force. Cal accidentally realized he had this power one day, and he went about messing around with it. He was able to touch an object and see into the past due to his feeling with it. He didn't understand it, and when he confided in Master Kenobi, he learned that it was psychometry, which was something that Quinlan Voss was able to use. Obi-Wan didn't know how it worked, but he was at the very least familiar with the concept of it so he could help a student through it. Because of a student being so active in life and still recovering from his injury, Obi-Wan would avoid faking his death to go after a collection of bounty hunters who were trying to capture the Chancellor. Instead, the idea that Obi-Wan did come up with would be used with Mace Windu. The Jedi Master of the Order was heavily responsible for what followed his presence during the mission. He was able to kill Count Dooku in the process, and while the death of Dooku was great, it also landed Cat Bane back in jail as well. The death of Dooku at the hands of Mace Windu would send ripples through the galaxy and completely change the demeanor of the Separatist Council and Senate. Not all of them agree with Dooku's plans, but considering Mina Bontiri died after her attempt at peace, there is more persuasive voices in the Separatist Senate that wish for peace to take over. Though with Palpatine at the helm, he was preparing a means to disjoin the entire peacemaking process again. While all this was going on across the galaxy, another leg of Cal's friendship with Ahsoka was completed during the Siege of Onderon, or more so the rebel cell that was forged on Onderon. Cal and Ahsoka were left on the ground with the rebels to assist them, while both Kenobi and Skywalker vacated the surface. Cal and Ahsoka's bond with the other had grown with each other, and now they were actively good friends, almost a brother-sister relationship. Ahsoka was obviously the older sister, and she tasked herself with the responsibility of looking after Cal. Their success would have the bond of their friendship solidified, being that they were both critical pieces to the rebellion on Onderon working. The victory on Onderon was only more proof that the Separatists were crumbling from the inside out. Turns out millions of battle droids aren't as friendly as living, breathing clones. Not that the clones were treated like people anyways, but they were much better received than the battle droids when they descended onto planets. Palpatine actively tried to keep the peace from continuing. He did this by using General Grievous, but because Kenobi and Skywalker were already in the general vicinity of Raxus, they were sent there to assist in the negotiations. Cal and Ahsoka, who were coming from Onderon, were lucky, thanks to Ahsoka, able to avoid a confrontation with Grievous, not like Ahsoka hadn't already tangled with the droid general twice. Because Grievous was busy hunting Padawans, he wasn't really ready when the duo of Kenobi and Skywalker pounced like hunters onto the droid general. It was a hefty fight, but in the 
end, Obi-Wan and Anakin were able to destroy General Grievous, which only solidified the Separatist Senate's decision on ending the war. This move by Grievous made the plot around the war a little bit more peculiar. There was something odd about the whole thing. Not to point fingers or say they did what, but for Grievous to attack after Palpatine begrudgingly accepted the peace treaty didn't sit right, especially not with the Separatist or Kenobi. Ahsoka picked up on it a little bit, especially after having spent so much time with Padme on several missions, including the one that had them meeting Mina Montiri. Everything seemed just a little off. Regardless of that, the Galactic Republic accepted these terms of surrender and a ceasefire began. Though with everything seemingly heading towards peace, Palpatine knew he couldn't establish an empire, so he'd rip the fabric of everything apart. This would result in the worst day of Cal's life, the day Order 66 was executed. He and Obi-Wan were on a Venator in the Outer Rim, in Separatist territory. Commander Cody turned on them, which led to the rest of the clones to attack. If Cal was with any other Jedi, he would have either died or his master would have died at the very least, trying to protect him. Though Obi-Wan was a calculated and prepared enough master to defend his student and his own life. The two Jedi were able to get to the hangar bay and board a shuttle and escape. It wasn't easy and it did cost a couple of clone trooper lives, but they were able to escape. For Obi-Wan, it wasn't an easy thing, but he had to defend his student and there were a couple clones that were just hit with deadly deflections, none of them being intentional. Order 66 would have a nasty side effect on the galaxy as a whole, and it would have some Separatist loyal systems revolting against the Republic and the Peace Treaty itself, which resulted in a second version of the Clone Wars. It wasn't galaxy-wide by any means, just more so confined in a smaller location in the Mid Rim. And on top of everything, Palpatine just disappeared. Though with such a small fighting force actually fighting for him and with him, he would essentially be trapped. While Anakin didn't perish during the events, people from the council did. Shocked, he was killed and so was Kiare Mundi. Yoda and Windu immediately began their search for Palpatine, which would lead them to thinking that he was a part of the small resistance of droid forces, though by the time they found him, he would have been killed, ironically by his own doing. The Separatist armies, collectively, were stronger than the little resistance Palpatine was having, and while the Jedi were far removed from this many clone wars, they were able to learn that Palpatine had died, allowing them to retreat away from the center of the galaxy. Without a temple bombing committed by Bera Sophie, the collective people of the galaxy, while having a bit of disdain for the Jedi, wouldn't outright wish for their downfall. Seeing that Obi-Wan and Anakin were responsible for allowing the peace talks to continue, uninterrupted, they found a lot more favor for the Jedi. With thousands of Jedi gone because of the Purge, they had to move away from the forefront of the galaxy to allow the politicians to make right of a broken down system. As the Jedi moved away from the front of the galaxy, the Republic and the Clone Wars, Obi-Wan was called back to Mandalore to assist Bo-Katan against Darth Maul. Without a clone army to back them, they couldn't do it. However, Anakin and Obi-Wan together could, as individuals, go and kill Maul, and so that's what they did. With the Sith completely extinguished, there was a chance for redemption for the galaxy, but a lot of work needed to be done to ensure the galaxy could fix itself. Obi-Wan would continue Cal's training until he was ready to become a knight. Cal, despite his early life struggles, was able to adopt Form 6 and become a very powerful young Jedi. Because of the events that played out during the Purge, Ahsoka would actually stay inside the Jedi Order, despite some of her indifferences towards the Council. However, these thoughts would be challenged once Anakin abandoned the Order a couple years later when he and Padme had themselves some children. Luke and Leia would be born years later after the Purge, which was a result of the stress put onto both of their parents from the end of the Clone Wars and the focus on restoring order to the galaxy. Cal, on the other hand, would represent a new generation of incredible talents inside the Order. Thanks to the teachings he received from Kenobi, he'd be prepared to take on his own student. Cal and Ahsoka would mimic the bond between Obi-Wan and Anakin, both of them taking on students at the same time and continuing the legacy established by their teachers. Cal and Ahsoka's students would be very close to each other and develop the same brother and sister bond that their teachers had before them, as the galaxy rebuilt around them and restructured after the fall of Sith. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is our story. Again, special thanks to Galvin Gaming, Tristan, Darth Revan, Pimp Daddy Bane, The Last Jedi, Apollo, Jedi Sloth, Mr. Yeet Gamer, Mad Maddy Studios, Anakin 003, Lemon Knight, Rex the Wolf, The Man with Three First Names, Dark Saint 46, Baron Joshua and Lord Deadwing for supporting the channel. If you want to support me other ways, go check out the Patreon. The link is down below. You get access to super cool things. Otherwise, smash that like button. Let's talk about the story real quick. The uh, real thing that I wanted to change here, and the real thing that I think the difference of Cal being trained by Obi-Wan is, is that I think Cal would be a great talent. The, the main difference is Obi-Wan faking his death. I think that's really the main difference here, and I think that one little difference allows a lot of things to happen differently. Of course, in this scenario, I chose Mace Windu to happen and be put into 
Obu has placed to fill in his rank of Hardeen or maybe another bounty hunter. But the main point being is that with Windu filling that that role, it allows Windu to actually kill Dooku, and that just changes the entire sequence of events. But that is all the butterfly effect of Obi-Wan just teaching Cal. Because at this point, Cal is like 12, 13 years old, and so Obi-Wan isn't going to just be like, oh yeah, let me just like fake my death real quick, because that that's not really cash money. So anyways, I hope you all enjoyed the story. It was fun, short, little, cool little bond between Obi-Wan and Cal, but also allowing Cal and Ahsoka to have a similar relationship, like brother-sister kind of thing, like Obi-Wan being brothers with Anakin. Anyways, I hope you all enjoyed. I love you all. Spread the love. And always remember, my friends, may the Force be with you.